you're interested in expanding your universe, each one of them will have something that's interesting and new. It all takes place in the space of less than an hour. The questions were very knowledge-based. Take the work hat off, look at something cool, and think about things in a different way. very much Pamela and a very nice introduction so I'm moving on to the topic uh, today so the very high level topic was from our space to subsea uh, and uh, this uh, slide give you a little bit more detail about the exact topic uh, I'm going to cover uh, as a, a modular robotic system which has been developed for space uh, uh, in orbit servicing. So it's one of these uh, uh, European space robotic technology. I'm very fortunate to get involved. And uh, we try to use this technology to address a number of challenges in space uh, explorations uh, and potentially for other applications, which I'll cover today in the subsea area. So I'll give this presentation on behalf of my uh, colleagues, uh, the coordinator of MOSA project, Dr. Pierre Lettier and uh, Dr. Jeremy Cassent, the Vision Manager of Space Applications, uh, along with other partners, DLR, GMB, Thales Allian, both in France and the UK, and CITEL in Italy, Maxwell, uh, Strathclyde University, and uh, Ellison, et cetera. Right, so let's move on to uh, give you a little bit uh, uh, content uh, uh, introduction. So I'll spend very quickly about uh, uh, give you an introduction about my SMASTEC lab, and then move on to some uh, uh, challenges in space exploration. And some of these, I believe, is also relevant to the subsea area. Uh, then I'll give you a very quick introduction to the European effort uh, uh, under a program called PROSPERA uh, on the space uh, uh, strategic research cluster uh, sort of a, a effort. Uh, and then I'll focus on mostly on this MOSA modular uh, spacecraft assembly and the reconfiguration in space uh, for servicing and construction. So that will be the focus there. And I'll conclude the, uh, my talk by drawing some uh, key points and uh, what are the future directions, etc. So hopefully through these 20 minutes, you'll learn something we have uh, done in space uh, and, uh, and probably think, see how that could be used uh, in uh, subsea. Uh, so first, quickly introduction to my space mechatronic system technology lab. So we focus on the mechatronic technology and it provide expertise in, in a number of areas. First area is about the space mechatronic system development methodology. So we have a number of PhD students working in this area, essentially try to find the best methodology and proper approach uh, one should consider before you start working on a mechatronic system, which could be a robot, uh, could be other uh, integration of mechanical control systems, uh, et cetera. So we have developed a number of a methodology called, a modular methodology called Jim McCure uh, and the three pillow mechatronic design methodology, TIFF models, et cetera. So if any of you are interested in this, uh, I'll be delighted to talk to you after the talk. The second area we were working on, uh, we have been working on is on orbital space robotics uh, for on uh, orbit satellite servicing. Uh, I'll come to some of this later on. So essentially we try to develop a, uh, uh, novel concepts and uh, novel new ideas about how you would uh, reuse some of these uh, high value assets in space, uh, like refueling of the uh, satellite, uh, et cetera. And this covers uh, uh, model-based decision making, et cetera, uh, and vision-based uh, object recognition as well. The third area worth mentioning is about how we use some of these technologies developed in space uh, in terrestrial applications. Uh, here is an example of what we have done uh, in terms of uh, using space robotics in agriculture. And we developed an uh, agri rover, which you can see on this image, which can drill into the soil about 30 centimeter deep. Uh, collect the soil sample, and then do the in, in situ analysis of uh, nitrogen. So then the, now they tell uh, farmers instantly how much nitrogen 
uh, your soil contains in that particular case. So we do a, a range of mechatronic systems and hopefully that'll give you the idea about what we do. Move on to the space challenges uh, in the uh, over the last uh, probably uh, 40 years. Uh, this chart here shows you the uh, dramatic cost uh, reductions uh, since 1981. At that time, a space shuttle costs about uh, uh, 95,216 US dollars to launch per kilo payload. And this moves on as technology improves, uh, uh, all uh, different technology has been developed. And this uh, cost you can see is decreasing over a period of time. Uh, it's worth mentioning uh, SpaceX technology Falcon 9 in 2017. You can see the cost at that time is about uh, 1,891 US dollars per kilogram. That's a significant reduction over that uh, compared with the space shuttle. And one of the key reasons for that is the reuse of uh, uh, some of these launch vehicles, especially the first stage of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Falcon 9. And the move on to that, uh, Falcon 9 being developed into Falcon he Heavy, and of course, uh, comes to a milestone of just under one thousand US dollar, about 951 US dollars per kilogram. So this is a, a significant development over a period of time. So industry is looking for increased flexibility and cost reduction as a challenge we face. And uh, also, more importantly, I try to decrease the launch cost per kilogram. Uh, hence, as a result of that, uh, we can increase the launch uh, frequencies. You can send more stuff on that. So with that, one of the benefits uh, of these costs have come down. So well, not more people interested in developing satellites and you can probably uh, notice there, uh, there's lots of a uh, cube set, uh, even nano set has been developed. So a lot more space uh, uh, craft has been sent into the space. Uh, so you can guess and the space getting very busy. Uh, it's estimated uh, uh, there will be 128 million pieces of debris uh, smaller than one centimeter in space uh, by uh, January 9, 2019. So you can see space becomes a lot busier and, uh, and that potentially can uh, cause risks uh, in future. So space industry becomes an interesting ecosystem and try to make use of reuse some of these resources and the developing technology. One of the key technology is about the robotics, uh, which I'll cover on this. So based on this, we can see there's lots of opportunities um, for space vehicles and also uh, technologies required to cover the uh, reuse and this is essentially about sustainability of the use of space there. So with this, uh, European Commission uh, has uh, uh, embarked on a number of uh, uh, strategic uh, decisions uh, and these are the four strategic uh, priority areas they try to uh, uh, explore to so maximize benefits of space for society. Uh, space, uh, as uh, everybody knows, is very expensive, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's estimated every one euro invested in space brings about 10 euros benefit to the economy of Europe and try to uh, increased collaboration around uh, among uh, European space holders uh, and also make uh, Europe as uh, a global actor. So under this uh, high level strategic priority, there's a program starting 2014 called Prospera, which essentially coordinated the strategic development in space robotics in Europe. And on this diagram, you can see uh, the first call 2016 has tried to uh, uh, develop uh, what we call the common building blocks, essentially five common building modules, which will be the foundation of future space uh, robotics. Uh, I'm very fortunate in two of these in OG3 uh, and OG5. OG stands for operational grants. Each of these grants is about 3 million euros uh, involving most European space uh, uh, players, etc. And this move on, uh, then the uh, and, until the current stage, so the next batch is uh, uh, using the, these five building blocks to develop uh, uh, demonstrators. So MOSA is one of these projects uh, uh, we are working on. Uh, this uh, overall, this roadmap aims to uh, provide a long-term lasting technologies which uh, uh, will 
position Europe as the leader in the uh, uh, sustainable use of space uh, uh, technology. So we're working on some of these exciting projects as now. Uh, so for MOSA, this is a, a very high level summary. So it's, uh, uh, it's one of the five projects funded under EU Horizon 2020, Space 12 Tech 2018. And we have uh, uh, 24 months uh, to complete the project. Uh, it's very uh, time uh, critical and very tough, lots of uh, uh, tasks we need to complete. We have uh, nine partners uh, uh, listed here as coordinated by space applications. And use basically five technologies on that. Uh, we developed in the first phase of the uh, development. So the key point I like to mention is about the shift of a paradigm. Uh, and this is uh, unlike the traditional, what we call the monolithic design, which tend to focus on one bespoken and very, very inflexible uh, structure, but highly, typically highly optimized the design. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is a type of uh, like uh, uh, previous uh, expandable launch vehicles uh, uh, and other technologies they tend to be one use uh, and take a long time to develop and takes a long time to get onto the market. So we change that uh, uh, to the paradigm uh, to modular design. So in this case, you have lots of uh, flexibility, adaptability. Uh, it also becomes reusable for many of these technologies uh, in our process. Uh, uh, and the satellites uh, can then be maintained previously. Once you send a satellite worth probably a billion to space after 10, 15 years, then becomes uh, a debris and so on. So I'll give you a, a, a quick uh, a pick of what we... The world can be complex sometimes, so it is easy to lose track of what is happening outside. Existing commercial satellites have very limited or no capability of servicing and maintenance. These platforms are not economically sustainable and can increase the space debris. We need a paradigm shift to solve this problem for future generations. The MOSA project proposes a reconfigurable and modular design for satellite constellations. A set of reusable spacecraft modules will extend and update their capabilities control, power, thermal management, or multiple sensors. A symmetrical walking robot has been designed to efficiently move in the platforms and perform manipulation tasks. Everything will be interconnected by standard robotic interfaces, providing mechanical, data, power, and thermal transfer. Additionally, a functional engineering simulation environment will offer assistance for modules design, system configuration, and operation planning. Are you ready to connect? Right, so that hopefully give you a rough idea about this uh, system. So uh, we are essentially working on the, uh, this uh, concept of a modular uh, and the reconfigurable uh, spacecraft uh, project with MOSA. Uh, so the key components of this is we essentially develop a modular robot called MOSA and use this modular robot to develop a, a modular satellite uh, on orbit uh, assembly, uh, essentially. So we are in the process of developing a ground demonstrator 
uh, for this on-orbit modular satellite configuration, construction, uh, and using the uh, various of technologies we have uh, developed in the first phase of five operational grounds, and also the current uh, simulation tools, et cetera. And uh, this video hopefully give you a bit more technical details about uh, what the system is actually do in great detail. So as you can see, we call this walking manipulator. It can walk within the constructor space and can pick up the object satellite and then, then move on to the next uh, uh, task. Uh, so that would allow uh, uh, modular satellite in space uh, constructed by this walking manipulator, MOSA, in our process. So the project involves two aspects. We develop a ground segment. Uh, uh, we have a, a control center there. Uh, we have a planner simulator, try to plan everything in uh, correct to make sure everything works okay. And then that is linked to the space segment uh, and the robot will be able to pick up a module which it need to be connected and then will uh, construct that uh, uh, in a modular uh, fashion to gradually build up a, a, a new type of a satellite. So in future, uh, if any of this module becomes faulty, then it's also possible to replace that module. Uh, so you'll get a much more sustainable use of this asset. The key technology we have been developing, focusing on this few, one is the standard interface. So we start with the uh, uh, interface called Serum. Now we have a chain this to hot dock. And this to provide a secure link, which enable you to transfer data, power, uh, thermal uh, control, and also mechanical control uh, as well. Uh, the walking manipulator is a very important technology, as you already seen. It can walk and it's flexible, and it's got vision. It can autonomously guide this system to walk within the working space. Uh, the design simulation tool is a, a critical developed by colleagues from DLR. Uh, and that provide the real-time control and simulation of the system. And the, with all this technology, then we can de develop a spacecraft uh, modular satellites, essentially, in that regard. So we have used these five building blocks uh, as ROCOS. It's a, essentially a robotic uh, control operating system. Ergo, that's the planning, task planning, manipulation, uh, uh, scheduling, et cetera. Uh, Infuse provide an uh, understanding uh, of the perception of the environment. And then that's supported by a suite of uh, sensors called ICDS. Uh, and uh, all these uh, mechanical systems joined by the hot dog in our regard. So that hopefully gives you a, a, a reasonable quick understanding of what uh, the MOSA project is about and its background in the wider European context. Uh, let's look at how this potentially could be used in the uh, subsea application. So first slide I've got here uh, shows uh, uh, a typical subsea structured uh, environment where I suggest uh, or we could potentially use some of this uh, walking manipulator along the pipe or your platform. And uh, that would uh, help be able to use for typical operations like inspecting uh, or uh, small repairs uh, and that type of uh, uh, operations, uh, and that can be done. Uh, the next slide I uh, have here uh, shows, uh, you know, for this type of a large structure, uh, again, uh, if there's a requirement for inspection, especially on the underside of this bridge, it's very difficult for a human uh, operator to do anything here, uh, and very risky, and it's also difficult to probably have a, uh, some ROVs probably placed in those areas to uh, to uh, give you a good understanding about this. Uh, so this could be uh, used uh, for the uh, this type of uh, operations uh, uh, in, in inspections and the small repair. Uh, equally, uh, if there is a need for future uh, construction of this type of a structure, uh, and like uh, uh, what we try to do in space, you you have a modular walking manipulator, you make it a uh, system, uh, uh, a big system as a, a module, and that would uh, allow you to uh, construct uh, uh, more efficiently, and probably also help you to repair some of these. 
Uh, this is uh, another subsea uh, environment. Uh, the current technology is ROV. I understand that it will uh, be difficult to access inside of this structure. But whereas you, if you have a walking manipulator, which is uh, uh, dexterous and is uh, small enough or could be big enough, uh, and it can navigate uh, autonomously using its uh, onboard sensors and uh, uh, intelligent softwares, et cetera, to walk around in the structure and to, to, to do the inspection and some uh, light duty manipulation type of operations. Uh, so there's a, a number of uh, areas uh, I, I believe uh, uh, we, we could uh, explore uh, and the uh, European Commission is very keen to see some of these technologies exploited uh, not only in space but in other sectors uh, and it's great, uh, you know, we can I have uh, this talk and uh, be, it would be better if we have face-to-face -face so we can uh, explore, discuss with the uh, colleagues working in this uh, uh, area. Uh, but still, I think uh, with this uh, uh, technology, uh, it has lots of uh, potentials. Uh, I see, especially in the North Sea area, uh, we can work on. Okay, Professor Tan, you've got two minutes to go. Okay, thank you, Pamela, for the reminder. So I'm near, near the end of the presentation. So uh, that is a two potential area. I mean, there's uh, other areas in the decommissioning applications uh, uh, and uh, uh, maybe future modular type of oil uh, exploration platform construction. I'm sure you already do lots of modular uh, structures, etc. But see, uh, some of these may be used. I think especially in the context of uh, uh, removing risks, uh, sending divers uh, uh, to uh, to difficult working environment like this. Uh, I think uh, this cert technology certainly have uh, potentials to fill that gap. Uh, I have worked with the, in the past with uh, some companies in Aberdeen, uh, and the diver diving chamber can be sometimes really challenging. So I draw uh, a conclusion uh, uh, based on what I've talked. So uh, as you can uh, see. Uh, Europe has developed five common building blocks for modular robotics, uh, Estrocos, Ergo Infused ICDS, Outdoor Serum, uh, and these all provide the common building blocks for space. So they can be uh, used for a number of applications. MOSA is just one of these. Uh, there are other applications we interest that I can uh, explain to you later on. Uh, they essentially provide a universal plug play type of system. A lot of flexibility you can have and you can reconfigure uh, to any number of degree of freedom of a robot you wish. Uh, and they also can be changeable structure for space applications. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, that's the focus of what we try to do. We also try at the moment to try to develop a refined concept of a modular for reconfigurable uh, spacecraft uh, in the context of uh, orbit servicing and uh, assembly. Uh, we believe this technology will uh, be disruptive uh, in, in a sense, it will uh, uh, allow future serviceable uh, satellites to be launched. So that would uh, uh, reduce costs even more significantly and also make a space more sustainable. Uh, we, have a, we are in the processing of developing this ground-based on-orbit uh, modular satellite uh, demonstration system. And uh, I'll keep you updated. If you're interested, let me know. And we will be doing some demonstrations later for the project. Uh, space exploration, as you can imagine, is very challenging. This is only one aspect I mentioned in orbit servicing. There are also areas like planetary exploration, which I'm also involved in. There's lots of uh, still need to be done, uh, and lots of work done by NASA and other uh, space stakeholders has been doing a fantastic job, but still long to be done. And MOSA, uh, very important, got a lot of potentials uh, uh, for uh, exploitation gas offshore sectors. Uh, I welcome your thoughts on that. So finally, I'd like to thank uh, all my project partners and the partners from uh, uh, Prospera, Dr. Gianfranco Vicinti as the coordinator for Prospera, and my team on MOSA uh, with uh, all colleagues uh, uh, working on supporting this project. And also thanks for European Commission for funding for this project. So thank you very much for your listening and I'll be delighted to answer any questions you have. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Professor.
Jan for that interesting uh, um, presentation. We uh, have a number of questions for you coming in thick and fast. Please do uh, post your questions or if you would like to uh, present your questions yourself to Professor Jan, uh, I'd be happy to um, um, let you have a, 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 to, to speak. So um, let's just go to some of the questions here. We've got questions from uh, let me start with uh, Rob Bay. Rob says, what stage of development is the walking manipulator in? Right, uh, very good question. I guess uh, that would be uh, something uh, people are interested to know and I'm delighted people want to find out more on that. So the walking manipulator uh, has been developed to a stage. We have done the, all the simulation modeling. You have seen some of this. Uh, that's uh, already completed. Uh, uh, and then the uh, mechanical part, the hot dog has been constructed and uh, so we developed several of these uh, and we are in the processing of uh, 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 finalizing the detailed design of the walking manipulator and uh, shortly uh, we will have another final uh, review of the, of the design and after that then we will be able to start constructing. So it's in the process manufacturing components uh, and after final review, I will put them together uh, on the manipulator, walking manipulator. The software uh, operating systems and uh, uh, the uh, planner, scheduler, and all these uh, have already been developed. Okay, fantastic. So uh, I'm going to try as best as possible to get through your questions, but if not, you know, we'll carry on on LinkedIn on the conversations. That was very interesting. Um, I'm just going to go now to uh, Gary Millard. Gary says, I see this as a good tool for drill support and uh, valve operations, but not possible to retrofit. So would you need to be, uh, f would it need to be for new or green field projects? Uh, very good question, very technical on that. Uh, you probably noticed from presentation the key to the walking manipulator has got this uh, interface for dock. So uh, you correctly said uh, there needs a, a retrofit for this exact technology to be used. Uh, but I'm aware and also involved in some of the other research which probably have less restraints, uh, constraints on how you walk. Uh, so there are other alternatives. We can apply the same uh, walking manipulator uh, but probably use a inter different interface on that. So uh, that's a long answer. So in short, uh, we can have this on your oil drill platform, but with a slight different interface, so that I'll still be able to walk on the your platform. Okay, fantastic. Uh, lots of comments saying thank you. It was a great presentation. And I will also now go to um, Lawrence McCree, Lauren says, uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I was pleasantly surprised at the reduction in costs in the uh, aerospace industry from slide two. I'm sure over the, over the same uh, period, the oil industry costs to drill a well would have substantially increased. I'm sure there are several reasons for the improvement in aerospace industry in cost reduction, but what would you class as the main one? That's a load of comments and questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, sorry, you repeat the last part of the question again. So, is so there... uh, the last part of the question is, um, um, I'm sure there are several reasons for the improvements in the aerospace industry in cost reduction, but yeah. what would you class as the main one? The main one, right. Uh, I'm... I didn't have much time to elaborate on that, but I, you probably remember I didn't mention Falcon 9 from SpaceX. Uh -huh. uh, one of the key cost uh, reduction driver was about the reusability. Uh, SpaceX has uh, spent over lots of time, resources, tried to develop this uh, reusable launch vehicle. And uh, they have uh, achieved uh, stage one reusability. Uh, by reusing that particular stage, that has uh, significantly reduced the cost from uh, you know, tens of thousands to just uh, over one thousand uh, dollars uh, per kilo. So mm -hmm. that's one of the key factors. Uh, plus other factors like uh, optimization of uh, uh, manufacturing new 
uh, fuel efficiency, etc., uh, and uh, also the uh, I guess uh, also down to the young, vibrant, uh, talented working force. <laughs> uh, they all working, uh, you know, uh, uh, spend much more longer time. I would say <laughs> than normal nine to five operation. That, that's probably also another fact. That's something I read from the news. Uh, and that's what you refer to in your presentation as the uh, paradigm shift in, in terms of flexibility of the modularity of it. Exactly, yeah. The key thing is about reusability. If yeah. you reuse, I mean, it's like, a, as I mentioned, a you know, satellite typically costs a big one, about one billion uh, US dollar. After 15 years, that becomes a space junk. But if you, uh, one of the main reasons is uh, uh, few run out. If you refuel uh, some satellite, every other part perf you know, works perfectly fine. And if we just refueling that satellite, uh, give you another uh, you know, few years life, then you extend the life of that system. And then you also increase the, uh, reduce the cost significantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, following on that, uh, Roger from uh, your UTC says, uh, great presentation, lots of opportunity. Uh, could we repurpose the walking manipulator to include cutting equipment to replace people working at height in decom? Uh, cutting equipment, did you say? Yeah, yeah to reduce yeah. cutting equipment uh, for people working at height, for example. Yeah, uh, I see there's uh, lots of uh, potential there as well. Uh, uh, and this uh, uh, is it designed to be intended to work remotely, on, 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 you know, uh, away from the operator. Uh, so it can be a good buddy to any operator, both uh, nearby or in a slight uh, awkward or more difficult, challenging uh, place where this uh, uh, little fellow can tell you, oh, what's uh, going on there? You should mm -hmm. be careful of this when you do the cutting or whatever. So yeah, yeah I think, uh, uh, I mean, one thing I do feel uh, is uh, extremely applicable in subsea environment. This is essentially, it's a structured environment. You have yeah. lots of pipes, uh, uh, manifold, uh, frames, etc. cetera. Uh, this is uh, less challenging than the, even like my agri-rover working in the farming field. You don't right. have both there. And the walking manipulator, if we can attach this to uh, existing subsea structure, and it can work uh, uh, autonomously on the self because we have this infused uh, uh, software capability which can use this vision, multi-sensory mm -hmm. uh, system to understand the environment, and it can work autonomous on self, or it can communicate with the operator to provide insights uh, on a particular site or particular location. Of mm -hmm. Hmm. So, I mean, one of the key questions in decommissioning at the moment is obviously how we power equipment and facilities. So, uh, a couple of questions from our, our, our um, audience members. Dave Russell says, I assume the manipulator is solar powered. How have you thought how uh, such a device may be powered sub C? And um, how do you think that, that could operate? Uh, very interesting question for any robotics power is always. Uh, uh, challenging issue uh, in, in this uh, application. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I haven't uh, thought about this uh, uh, in great detail, but I would uh, imagine, uh, you know, the on onboard power will be limited. But again, we have a, a, a very good infrastructure there already, and maybe it's possible to have uh, 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 some charging stations along the way of the structure, mm -hmm. or we could have an umbilical uh, attached to the uh, walking manipulator. This is something we can explore. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, like any system, like uh, uh, my Agri Rover, we designed mm -hmm. only working uh, farm for eight hours. So that's the limit uh, based on that requirement. Mm -hmm. And it ha has to come back for recharging yes. uh, and, and so on. So uh, power is a, a issue. Uh, the other thing on the power is. Uh, uh, lots of uh, planning, planning tasks we do is try to optimize the uh, performance, essentially try to minimize the energy consumption uh, in the system. Uh -huh. So in the uh, video I showed there, you probably seen there's lots of different sequences, different operations. You can do this first or the other first. Uh, then there's uh, lots of planning we can do to optimize uh, 
uh, this so that essentially will minimize the energy demand. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we're just halfway, th over halfway through the Q and A uh, session. So, if you, uh, if our audience have any questions, please post them. I'll try to get as many through. Although we we already have a number of questions to get through, so that's fantastic engagement from uh, our audience members. Just. Uh, demonstrating how interesting this particular presentation is. Um, I'll take another question from Jonathan Bird, who says, how does the walking manipulator, manipulator attach itself to the structure? Is it magnetic, uh, suction, mechanical, or mechanical? Yeah. Uh, I briefly mentioned the hot dog uh, has four capabilities in terms of uh, uh, transferring four type of uh, uh, things, I would call probably once the data so you can transfer through the core connector, uh, mm -hmm. very high rate, da data rate, one uh, gigabyte bit data rate, uh, data. So lots of imagery, high volume data can be transferred through that system. Uh, the connection is uh, through mechanical uh, structure and provide a very uh, robust, a very uh, strong connections between two uh, connector. Uh, they also provide electrical power through the this connector, and finally, uh, it can, in space application, as you can imagine, there's a huge temperature changes. So we have to have a good yeah. thermal management. So it also can uh, push through lots of uh, uh, thermal uh, energies through the connector. So it's yeah. a mechanically connected. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Tony Morgan says, thank you. Very interesting development work. Uh, what payload uh, capability are you planning for the initial manipulator design? Uh, the, we, we, we work on this, uh, uh, obviously, for the space applications. Uh, uh, and check on this specific payload. I think it's about uh, uh, 10 kilograms. So that's the uh, target we aim for. But I need to check on that. So it's uh, for space applications, not a uh, huge uh, at the moment. Uh, that may be something if uh, we consider to use this for uh, subsea uh, applications, something we need probably uh, explore to see how that can be scaled up. Right. Right. Okay, and we also delighted to have Willie Reed with us. Willie says, how critical are the sensors in the application? Uh, very good question. Uh, sensors uh, is essentially embedded, uh, embedded in uh, a number of uh, areas or number of uh, components uh, in MOSA project. Uh, we have sensors embedded in the uh, connector, uh, so we need to make sure all the sensor uh, tells uh, us uh, the connection is secure, is uh, uh, solid, and is uh, uh, secure, etc. Uh, then the uh, suite of uh, IC, uh, D, uh, ICDS uh, uh, sensor system is used for the uh, navigation perception aspect. So as walking manipulator walk around, uh, it need to understand uh, what is uh, around it. Uh, and based on this information, then it will plan its uh, movement accordingly. Uh, you know, it's not obviously the uh, last thing you want to happen is this uh, walking manipulator crash uh, or crash into something uh, it's uh, working with that. So we have uh, this uh, a suite of uh, uh, sensor uh, systems developed by uh, TAS UK, colleagues from UK, uh, actually uh, working on that. So this uh, uh, navigation perception sensor does provide that type of uh, capability uh, mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Uh, and then we have uh, sensors which uh, have been developed to recognize uh, uh, the shape of the object we're going to deal with, yeah. uh, the, even the size, try to measure the size, etc. So that would give a much uh, precision based uh, understanding of the environment. Right. Well, I'll take two more questions and then I'll wrap up for today. Uh, question again from Gary Millard. Uh, how is uh, mission planning uploaded to the walking manipulator? Right. If you remember the slides, uh, I have a ground segment and a space segment. So we do have a, 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 a real-time connections between those two systems. Uh, so the connection is just through, uh, uh, through the, the, those two seconds through uh, a number of uh, uh, possible ways. Uh, uh, I think uh, at the moment we are still exploring po possible options, but certainly as uh, I mentioned, uh, 
we use uh, something called space wire uh -huh. as a data connection uh, mechanism protocols. We use that for uh, connections between walking manipulators uh, yeah. and also the, uh, the ground segment. Uh, Okay, another question from Rob Bain here. Are there any existing subsea technologies such as uh, electrohydraulic connectors and hot stabs that would benefit space? So this really speaks to the transferability and knowledge transfer and the importance of this uh, cross-sectoral interaction. You know, so you're talking about space uh, technology coming into uh, subsea. So now we're thinking, are there any subsea uh, uh, technologies such as uh, electrohydraulics connectors that could apply to? Absolutely, absolutely. May, uh, just uh, for your information, uh, in the previous project on the building, common building block uh, project on the interface, uh, uh, I was an academic lead for that. So I have to, obviously one of the job I have to do is try to do a thorough literature review. So we look at a whole range of uh, connectors uh, and we publish a paper on that uh, has been very well received. So we look at uh, all uh, sectors, the uh, connection, and uh, try to learn from a different sector and eventually uh, develop this new European uh, interface standard. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think there's a, uh, another stage, you know, we, uh, with my postgraduate, uh, postdoc researchers and the students, et cetera, we, uh, uh, some of whom didn't have much uh, space experience, so they have to, uh, mm -hmm. reach out and learn from other sectors. But similarly, from this, we can transfer back some of this space uh, standard now, uh, it's the European standard now, uh, back to uh, offshore oil gas sector. Why not? Absolutely. Well, you know, um, it's been an interesting conversation, but I'm just going to wrap up with a, a final question from myself. Are you engaging with operators and, and uh, particularly in the oil and in gas industry or um, how have you approached that process to engage more uh, takers in the oil and gas industry? For oh, thank you for that question, Pamela. Yes, uh, uh, based in Glasgow, which is not that far away from Aberdeen, so yeah. I'm uh, very interested in, and also have been active uh, in linking with the colleagues uh, uh, from OGTC uh, and uh, Pamela and uh, Roger and other colleagues uh, uh, so I'm also involved in another project funded by uh, ODTC, which uses uh, UAV and uh, monitor the assets uh, of the North Sea or oil field, or no, in this case, I'm onshore, also onshore, etc. Uh, and uh, also hoping to work with uh, some operators on a decommissioning uh, project, uh, apply uh, slightly different technologies, a uh, haptic uh, robotic technology, another uh, branch of my interest in research uh, and uh, so we are having discussion on that uh, uh, if anybody uh, from the audience uh, saw this uh, part or any anything to do with the mechatronics uh, and uh, robotics uh, i'll be delighted to talk to you and have a uh, wider in engagement uh, uh, with the uh, company Fantastic. So obviously, um, you know, I, I second that uh, anyone listening who might be interested in any of this technology or how space technology can be adopted in the uh, oil and gas industry, uh, we at the OGTC would love to hear from you uh, and how we can work with Professor Tan to, uh, Professor Yan to, to transfer these knowledge, which are uh, obviously very relevant to the challenges in the oil and gas industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sure you will join me in thanking Professor Yu Tian Yan for his uh, fascinating presentation on how robotic technology and techniques with uh, space uh, can be could be uh, used to improve autonomous oil and gas uh, subsea activities. Uh, the space industry and the oil and gas industry both work at the leading edge of what is possible for technologies in extremely harsh environments. And Professor Yan's research is a demonstration of why cross-sectoral uh, collaboration and knowledge transfer is key in helping to drive safety, efficiency and environmental reduction in emissions in the oil and gas industry. Thank you once again, Professor Yan. We at the OGTC are looking forward to seeing how your project evolves. And uh, I'm sure I'd also like to thank those uh, joining us on this webinar and for your questions too. 
Thank you to uh, Rob Bay, to Lily Reed, to Lawrence McCree, to uh, a number of you out there who have posted your questions and those who have joined us today. Um, uh, thank you so much. There is a QR and uh, code for people to scan and it takes them to the upcoming Tech 20 schedule. If you can, kindly join us for the next Tech 20 next week, Friday at 11 o'clock. Uh, please complete the survey at the end of the webinar to give us your feedback. And remember to head over to LinkedIn to continue discussions with Prof. Zhu uh, uh, Yan Tan. And uh, we look forward to interacting with you and to your further questions. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Professor Yan, again. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and a yes. long weekend, spend holiday. Fantastic, yes, yeah. indeed. Thank you and have a great weekend all. Goodbye. Right. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.